Remembering Nancy Reagan, politicians, journalists, and celebrities pay tribute to the former First Lady. Big endorsement. Donald Trump talks a lot about making America great, but it's not just talk. Why Ben Carson says he's supporting the Republican frontrunner. Pope Francis celebrates his third anniversary, see the key moments which have defined his papacy. And Catholic education, why so few Hispanic students are enrolled in parochial school. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, March 11th, 2016. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Friends and family say a final goodbye to former First Lady Nancy Reagan. Her funeral took place this afternoon at the Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Grace, Representatives of presidential families came to pay tribute, including Michelle Obama, George and Laura Bush, and Hillary Clinton. Journalist Tom Brokaw was among those invited to speak, and Diane Sawyer read from the Gospel of John after sharing a personal story. She was way too interested in people and who you really were and what you really knew, all of us woven together in this life. And so we talked about politics and celebrities, and she told very wicked stories about old Hollywood and the days when life would throw you a curve and you got up and you put on your lipstick and you combed your hair and you kept the band playing. Nancy Reagan will be buried at the library next to her late husband. He died in 2004. Two big developments in the presidential race. We'll get to last night's debate in just a moment, but first, some big endorsements. We're going now to Jason Calvi, who is at the White House. Jason. Lauren, after months of slugging it out on the campaign trail, Dr. Ben Carson is endorsing Donald Trump. The two say they're moving on. Ben Carson praises his one-time opponent. He is actually a very intelligent man who cares deeply about America. A reporter asked Carson if God inspired the endorsement. I prayed about it a lot. And I got a lot of indications, uh, people calling me that I haven't talked to for a long time saying, I had this dream about you and Donald Trump. Trump says they didn't make a deal for a cabinet spot, but... Ben's going to have a big, big part, I can tell you. Ben, maybe Ben doesn't even know this yet, but Ben's going to have a big part. Trump says Carson will help with health care and education, while Trump's closest opponent, Senator Ted Cruz, racks in his first endorsement from a Senate colleague. I believe unity is more possible than ever before in this race. We need to unite behind Ted Cruz. Former presidential candidate Carly Fiorina also backed Cruz this week. <laughs> Former candidate Senator Lindsey Graham once called the choice between Trump and Cruz like being shot or poisoned. He tells me he's now open to Cruz. John Kasich and Marco Rubio are very dear friends of mine. They're more electable than Cruz, I believe. But in this outsider year, they seem to be viewed as insiders. And the only person who's consistently mounted a, a strong challenge to Trump has been Ted Cruz. He's not my preference, but I do believe he's a Republican conservative that would be better than Donald Trump for the party. Could we get a, could we get a Graham endorsement, do you think? Should we look let's, for that or not? Let's see what happens next week. Senator Graham tells me there are several reasons why he could back Cruz. He says Cruz would indeed support Israel, and he says that Cruz would give a conservative way to repeal and replace Obamacare. Lauren? Well, with this endorsement and others flying around on Capitol Hill, what do you think is going to be the impact on the Democratic and Republican matchup? Which candidate does the best? Well, if you look at the Real Clear Politics average of polls, you'll find that Hillary Clinton is beat by all of the Republican candidates except Donald Trump. Then we see Bernie Sanders, this is surprising, beating every single one of the Republican contenders. Jason Calvi, thank you very much. Donald Trump is changing tactics. Gone as the bombastic debater, a soft-spoken candidate emerged at last night's final GOP debate before critical Tuesday primaries. Lots of political jabs, but no low blows. So far, I cannot believe how civil it's been up here. That doesn't mean there weren't eye-opening moments on the debate stage at the University of Miami. 
GOP frontrunner Donald Trump again courted controversy by telling CNN that, quote, Islam hates us. Moderator Jake Tapper asked him to clarify his remarks. Did you mean all 1.6 billion Muslims? I mean a lot of them. I mean a lot of them. <laughs> Some laughter in the audience, but none from rival Marco Rubio. You can be politically correct if you want. I don't want to be so politically correct. I'm not interested in being politically correct. I'm not interested in being politically correct. I'm interested in being correct. This is the final GOP debate before more than 360 delegates go up for grabs Tuesday in key states like Florida and Ohio. Ohio Governor John Kasich is betting big that his home state will keep his campaign afloat. The math doesn't tell the whole story in <laughs> politics. You know the great thing about politics, you know the reason why we watch it? is because what's true today is not necessarily true tomorrow. Whether the more civil tone between the GOP candidate sticks remains to be seen. But Trump's chief rival, Ted Cruz, says he has a bigger mission than attacking his opponents. That we stop Washington from standing in the way of the hardworking taxpayers of America. The blame always goes to Washington. Well, a rare outcome to a Republican caucus in the Virgin Islands. Nobody won. Nine delegates are free agents who can support the candidate of their choice at the party's July convention in Cleveland. More Republican primaries tomorrow in Wyoming, Guam, and here in D.C. Democrats convene tomorrow in the northern Mariana Islands. And the big day is Tuesday. That's when juggernauts Florida and Ohio are up for grabs. Right now, Trump and Clinton are winning both states. These primaries are critical for Republicans, since both are winner-take-all. A new assisted suicide law in California will take effect in just 90 days. It will allow doctors to prescribe deadly drugs for terminally ill patients. The law, approved last year, was opposed by the Catholic Conference. The law allows Catholic hospitals and other religious facilities to opt out. California is the fifth state to adopt the practice. And Indiana could become the second state to ban certain abortions. Genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome would no longer be used as a reason to have an abortion. A spokeswoman for Governor Mike Pence says he will give the legislation thoughtful consideration. He is a pro-life Republican. And entire neighborhoods are underwater in southeastern Louisiana, forcing dozens of people to evacuate. This is obviously a very serious situation. Louisiana's governor warns residents not to underestimate the flood threat. The entire state is now under an emergency declaration following days of heavy rain. Record amount of water flowing from the lake. The roads are going underwater. No houses are being uh, cut off where people cannot go to and from. Louisiana's governor warns residents not to underestimate the flood threat. The entire state is now under an emergency declaration following heavy rain. The U.S. and its allies are using airstrikes and special ops forces to defeat ISIS. They're also cutting off their money supply. And it's working, Wyatt Goolsby reports. Iraq's military struggles to defeat ISIS fighters north of Baghdad. But multiple organizations are confirming military efforts to cut off ISIS' source of funding is working. According to leaked ISIS documents, the terrorists have cut its fighters' salaries in half and are struggling to provide services to people living within its territory. America is trying to create a system to counter what is called threat financing. So to make the financing of terrorism as illegal as actually a terrorist act itself. Counterterrorism expert Sebastian Gorka says the U.S. military has focused its airstrikes on some of ISIS's biggest sources of revenue, including oil fields, which provides hundreds of millions of dollars every year. This Defense Department video from January shows an airstrike hitting an ISIS cash depot. You can see bills flying through the air. Secretary of State John Kerry says efforts to hit ISIS in their wallets is paying off. There have been more than 10,000 airstrikes. People have been eliminated from the battlefield. We're eliminating their money. We're taking away their source of revenue. Gorka says it's true ISIS has lost millions thanks to coalition efforts, but he says cutting off the money won't be enough. Dictatorial regimes can last for decades, even if they are completely ostracized from the international economic system. Look at North Korea. Gorka says to defeat ISIS in the long run, the U.S. will need to work more closely with its allies like Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq, not just in military support, but in helping them fight an ideological battle against radical Islam. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. This Sunday marks three years since Pope Francis was elected leader of the Catholic Church. Since then, he's won over many hearts and sparked more than a few controversies. 
Ed Penton, Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, joins us now from the Eternal City. Ed, what have some of the bright spots and not so bright spots been of this pontificate? Okay, well, it's been quite a whirlwind, hasn't it, Lauren? We've had uh, a lot of uh, things going on during this pontificate. Uh, first of all, of course, within the church, we've had uh, uh, quite some advances in the reforms of the Roman Curia. We've had uh, reforms of the finances of the Vatican, so that's been quite an achievement of the Pope. Uh, there's been the Year of Mercy, of course, which is currently taking place. Um, but I think probably as more of his achievements have been seen outside the church in the sense that uh, he's become well known for his bridge building and diplomacy. He's, uh, he's, he's achieved that historic meeting between Patriarch Kirill. Um, he's also uh, helped uh, restore ties between uh, Cuba and the United States. Uh, so diplomatically, um, he's, he's been very successful and also he's very popular uh, worldwide. But there have been... Uh, Negative parts to this pontificate too, as there are with all of them. But this one, I think people have been concerned about the sort of level of confusion uh, that has emanated from this uh, pontificate. Uh, certain uh, question marks over doctrine, perhaps related to the two synods on the family. Um, so I think while the, the Catholic brand has been very good, I think there's some concern, some unease about some of the things that the Pope has done over the past three years. With that unease and the feeling in Rome, do you have any inkling of how Pope Francis is going to move forward on some of those more controversial issues? Yes, I think we can safely predict, Lauren, that he's going to, to move forward in terms of decentralizing the curia, decentralizing the church. That's going to be one of the big things, I think, coming up. Uh, I think also in terms of the synods on the family, we're going to see certain changes there. Um, but I think uh, generally it's going to be sort of more reform, more of the same, but uh, also a certain amount of unpredictability. Ed Penton from Rome. He's been covering the Vatican since 2002. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, sir. Coming up, serving more students, how Catholic schools can reach out to Hispanics, and how politicians are reaching out to Hispanic voters. What's at stake in the presidential race? Pope Francis's monthly prayer intention contains a Spanish language video message. He urges Christians to support families in need so children are raised in healthy and peaceful homes. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. A report out this week gives a sobering snapshot of the lack of U.S. Hispanics enrolled in Catholic schools. As Catherine Zeltner reports, Catholic leaders say the church needs to reach out more aggressively to Latino students. U.S. Catholic schools aren't reaching Hispanic Catholics, according to a new Boston College study out this week. It seems like uh, Hispanics do not see or are not perceiving Catholic schools as a resource for their children. While almost half of all U.S. Catholics are Hispanic today, the report claims the church isn't adjusting quickly enough. The nationwide survey finds there are more non-Catholics than Hispanics in Catholic schools. About 2% of Hispanic U.S. children are enrolled, and only 10% are in religious ed programs. The report's co-author says these statistics can hurt the future U.S. church. If we do not engage these new generations of Catholics, many of them actually are going to stop self-identifying as Catholic. The most important point is how we're going to make affordable. Bishop Mario Dorsonville, a Pope Francis appointee to D.C., says Catholic education is a major component of the church. The Colombia native says schools also play a key role for the approximately one-third of Hispanics living in poverty. The only way for us to fight back poverty is through education. Therefore, this is essential. We really need to focus on how to educate people to promote a better life for them. Bishop Dorsonville isn't discouraged by the latest numbers. Always challenges are opportunities in the life of the church. Catherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. A Pew Research Center report says the U.S. electorate this year will be the country's most diverse ever. It says a record 27.3 million Latinos will be eligible to vote in the 2016 presidential elections. Dr. Gracie Christie is policy advisor for the Catholic Association. She joins us from Miami. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Want to talk about Hispanics and voting. Can you tell me in the GOP race, why is it that Donald Trump in a recent poll has 38 percent of Hispanic voters? You no, know, Hispanic voters are like American voters in general. 
I think that they're reacting to what seems a virtue in Trump, that he's able to throw away political correctness and speak things that other people might be thinking but aren't comfortable saying. So I think that he's resonating the same way with Hispanics. Let's go to Clinton and Sanders. In your view, did they resonate with Hispanic voters during the Univision debate? They did resonate, and they offer what seem to be heartfelt solutions to the problems that Hispanics face that are the same problems American face, uh, Americans face in general, uh, whether the solutions will help or not. But what was interesting from a Hispanic perspective uh, was seeing someone, an avowed socialist like Bernie Sanders, taking such a strong position in American politics. So many Hispanics have had their lives crushed by socialism, whether in Cuba or Venezuela or Nicaragua, and it's a little strange to see that and even sad in the land of the free. And do you think that Hillary Clinton is hispandering or pandering to Hispanics? Well, when politicians come amongst us Latinos, they do change the way that they say things and and they do try to appeal to our, our worldview. Uh, what was interesting at the debate is that she does, uh, from our perspective, have a better sense of what's going on in Cuba, for instance, where the new openness from Obama has not resulted in any improvements in in the civil rights, the human rights of the people on the ground. So she she did uh, she did connect with us at that level for sure. You know, I think that Hispanics are Catholics who are Catholics are generally pro-life and pro-family. Why do you think they would vote for a Clinton or a Sanders? I think maybe it's a, a lack of formation, a lack of understanding that that when a, a, plat, a party has in it, as one of the planks in its platforms, uh, that abortion should be legal in all cases, this is a grave moral evil that uh, can't be weighed in the same way that we weigh other things that might be left up to the consideration of of a religious voter or a Catholic voter. Dr. Gracie Christie is policy advisor for the Catholic Association. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, a closer look at presidential stop, 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 politics, stop, stop. how the next primary election could cut the number of candidates. And celebrating three years of Pope Francis, see his effect around the world. Pope Francis returns to the Vatican after a week-long Lenten retreat outside Rome. The retreat focused on questions in the Gospels such as, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? From the Gospel of Mark. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. When it comes to foreign policy, certain statements by presidential candidates have raised concerns among Catholics. Earlier this week, Brian Patrick spoke with Dr. Joseph Capizzi, an expert about just war theory. Joe, he has since backtracked, but Donald Trump once said that he would authorize the U.S. military to go after family members of terrorists. What is Catholic teaching there? Um, family members of terrorists are innocent, and they are protected by the same moral law that would protect any innocent Americans or any innocent members of any other country. They are inviolable. We are not allowed to attack them. Makes perfect sense. Ted Cruz has reasserted his thoughts on torture. Here he addresses the ISIS threat. We will carpet bomb them into oblivion. I don't know if sand can glow in the dark, but we're going to find out. I'm not sure exactly what carpet bombing is, but I assume that it could come with a lot of civilian casualties. Clarify that for us. Yeah, carpet bombing refers to a strategy of bombing that is uh, completely uh, disregards any sort of discrimination between legitimate uh, attacks and uh, illegitimate targets of attack. Innocent people would be illegitimate targets of attack. So what he's, what he's saying is effectively the same thing as Donald Trump with regard to torture. We are going to be willing to attack even innocent people in order to achieve certain kinds of aims. Does it shock you at all that people who want to be the president of the United States wouldn't make statements like this? It shocks me. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, unfortunately, given the nature of the tone of a conversation um, this campaign season. But it shocks me because both of these views are so immoral. They're immoral from a Catholic perspective. They're immoral from international, even domestic law. Um, and I think, quite frankly, they're also irresponsible. They both, both show a kind of carelessness with regard to America's role in the international community and how we ought to be standing up for the things that uh, we've defended for decades at this point. So what's a Catholic to do in this election? I mean, we, we are concerned about our own security, our national security, right. yet want to stay with church teaching. Right. I don't think we need to be afraid of um, the American military here. The American military is a fabulous institution. Uh, 
the, the men and the women who are, serve in our military will keep us safe, um, despite the carelessness of these, these candidates with regard to this. The military gets it right more often than not, and they will do what is necessary to make our country safe by abiding the laws um, that Catholics can get behind. That is encouraging. Dr. Joe Capizzi from the Catholic University of America, thanks a lot for your insight. My pleasure. At the end of a long political week, we're bringing top journalists to make sense of it all. Betsy Woodruff is a political reporter with The Daily Beast, and Melinda Hennenberger is editor-in-chief at Roll Call. Melinda, the GOP debate last night took on a sober tone, as I did. said that they were using their inside voices last <laughs> night. That's what I tell my kids. What is happening? Why is Donald Trump turning that way as opposed to the bombastic debater we're used to seeing. I was wondering if they'd gotten calls from their moms saying, <laughs> please don't make it look like you were raised by wolves. <laughs> uh, I think there was a general sense that after the last debate before this in particular that they really needed to rein it in and that it was making the whole party and all of them, with the exception of John Kasich, really look foolish. So, but, but Trump, we've seen him pivoting for a minute now where he's really saying, you know, I had to be nasty to win. And now I'm presidential. I, yes, I'm and he has said, and I, you know, I know this may not appeal to women in particular, but sort of saying I'm not really like, I'm not really that guy. Right. Well, like, speaking of women, um, let's turn to you, Betsy Woodruff. The Washington, report, uh, Washington Post, rep Post reports that a Breitbart reporter, Michelle Fields, was grabbed by a, by Trump's campaign manager and thrown to the ground. And this is something that the Trump campaign completely denies happened. You are close friends with her. What happened? Yeah, I am close friends with her, so I can't be fully objective on this stuff. That said, the Washington Post report said she was almost thrown to the ground. She didn't actually fall down. She was knocked off balance. Um, her forearm was bruised. Since then, this morning, it's been reported that she filed charges with local police. Uh, she filed a police report, and local police are investigating allegations of misdemeanor battery that happened at the time and place. Um, so it's it's been a, a huge media story. Michelle's publication initially said they supported her 100%, and then this morning they published a piece that was basically like a Zapruder film rereading where they said, well, maybe actually this didn't happen. Maybe Michelle isn't right about what happened to her. So in the media world, um, including at my publication, there's a high level of shock. Uh, and and her skepticism. Publication up Melinda, we have seen over and over again uh, at Trump rallies um, that people uh, get to fisticuffs and uh, right. people are thrown to the ground. And yet, and, and attacks on women, um, Trump does that himself, yet he is still winning the women vote. Slightly. In Florida, though, it is surprising. He is ahead by two points with women in Florida. So, and he's running at parity in general with women, which you wouldn't necessarily think. I sent a bunch of reporters out to the CPAC, to the uh, conservative conference last week, to talk to women in particular. And of course there were mixed opinions, but there were a number of conservative women saying, he can't represent me, you know, this isn't conservative, the way he treats women. And certainly in the general election, if he is pivoting, the way he's talked about Megyn Kelly, the things he says about women in particular, you know, in general, I think can be a real problem for him going forward when he forward, says, right. I'm, the women are going to love me, I cherish them. He, he may need to reconsider the person who's running his campaign. Okay, right. Well, we have to leave it there. Melinda Hennenberger, editor-in-chief of Roll Call, Betsy Woodruff with The Daily Beast. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. As the Pope celebrates his third anniversary at the Vatican, we leave you tonight with a look back at his tenure. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Lauren Ashburn. Good night and God bless. I am most grateful for the invitation in the land of the free at the home of the brave. God bless America.